welcome all of you. I saw a lot of familiar names. I saw students. I saw some of our council members. Um, I, I, I saw a lot of people who are friends and I'm very happy that we have over 100 people joining this conversation. So I'll make the introduction. I'll be very short uh, in my introduction. Um, we have two excellent uh, speakers here, two true experts on what we will discuss uh, today. Um, Yadidia Stern is a professor of law at Bar Ilan University, where he, where he also uh, used to be a dean. He's also with the Israeli Democracy Institute, and uh, he directs there the program for Judaism and Human Rights. Uh, I think he was also one of the names mentioned as a possible future Minister of Justice at some point. I'm glad he's here with us. Um, our other speaker, uh, also professor of law at the University of uh, Haifa, Haifa University, uh, Professor Eli Salzberger. Uh, Eli Salzberger also was a dean of the law faculty. He um, is engaged in many research projects. He also runs a center um, for the study of law under extreme conditions, I think very fitting. Um, he also, like uh, Professor Stern, is a member of many committees and uh, involved very much, not only in academic study, but real life. Let me um, ask my first question to Ellie, Ellie Salzberger. Um, for those of you who didn't follow the news in the last hour, there is big news. Um, the two Benjamins, Netanyahu and Gantz, signed the deal. There will be a new unity government. And uh, maybe our friends from Israel have some news about this and tell us a little bit more of how this could look like. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone. It's good evening, Yedidia. Uh, it's nice to be with you. Uh, these are the news of the last hour. Uh, that indeed a coalition agreement was signed between Netanyahu and Gantz. And we can discuss about uh, the virtues and the disadvantages of this uh, agreement. Um, I think that um, basically Gantz succeeded in many of his uh, red lines with regard to the rule of law uh, that we will go to, to, we are going to talk about a little bit later, uh, but not in all. And um, according to this agreement, Netanyahu will continue as a prime minister, will serve as a prime minister for a year and a half. Then Gantz will serve as a prime minister for a year and a half. From previous encounters with our current prime minister, it's very, very important to safeguard this agreement. And this will go, is going to be by the legislator, hopefully. Uh, because we know previously that such agreement was not uh, um, uh, followed by Netanyahu. Um, it will be a government in which Gantz and his camp, including the Labour Party or uh, uh, what was left of the Labour Party, will have half of the ministries, including the Ministry of Justice, uh, Ministry of Culture, and various ministries in which the previous government did a lot of damage. Um, but how things will develop and whether, and I'll talk about it later, um, we can say the Israeli democracy is yet uh, a question that cannot be answered at the moment. Let, let me just, before I turn to Yadidia, let me just ask you, can you say anything about what I at least saw is the designated Minister of Justice, Avi Nissenkorn. What are we here to expect? Well, um, as you hinted before, Yadidia was mentioned for a while as a possible candidate, but Netanyahu vetoed him. I can say that maybe Yadidia, <laughs> you don't want to uh, say this. Nissenkorn is, um, you know, he used to be the head of the Histadrut. Um, he's not, uh, I, I think he's a lawyer, Yadidia might correct me, but he's not, a he's a lawyer, right? Uh, but he's not a legal expert um, and he didn't really engage before with legal matters, but I think the important thing that he is a trustworthy person um, um, 
on the gun side and um, at the moment you know the expectations that he will change course from the two or three previous ministry ministers of justice that we had who actually tried to basically uh, ruin our judicial and uh, public law uh, system in Israel. Thank you, Eli, and we'll come back to you, of course. Let's uh, switch to Yedidia, um, who um, luckily is with us because now he has a little more time than if he would have been called now as part of the government uh, formation. Um, Yadidia, uh, let's go a little deeper because when we convened the session, we of course didn't know that an hour before our session there would be a new government. And we called it the legal and constitutional crisis of Israel. Um, what would you confirm that you see a, a deeper crisis here? Even now we have a new government, it seems we have a new government. Yes, <clears throat> hello everyone. Uh, thank you for finding the time to check on us here in Israel on these uh, quite problematic days for all of us. <coughs> um, I would like to put on the table three major issues of concern for us Israelis today, and for me personally as well. One has to do with the politics of identity that tears us apart into some kind of cultural war here in Israel between different tribes with different agenda. And it reflects, that the war reflects itself into uh, the politics of the state. And that's why we didn't have a, a coalition till tonight for almost a year and a half. Uh, three uh, sets of election which was not decided and this is a reflection, a formal reflection of the problem that we do not agree on many, many major things. Um, so uh, this is one issue. You have to realize that uh, even if we have a government tonight, first of all, we do not know the details of the coalition government. And my experience says that you have to look into these details to, in order to know what kind of uh, agreement was done in favor of democracy and in favor of the rule of law and protecting liberal values. Uh, you have to realize that uh, till now for a year and a half, the Knesset uh, was hardly functioning because once the, nobody can be a prime minister, there's no coalition agreement, the Knesset is going home. So for the year and a half, we hardly had any Knesset uh, meetings. We did not have a budget. All this together puts uh, the democratic legitimacy of some of the institutions here in Israel in the eyes of the public in uh, close to the edge uh, situation. So the new coalition hopefully will be able to stabilize some things, but I agree with Eli, I do not trust that this will be for, long, for the long run. It's good for now, I think it's fragile, the situation is very shaky. Israeli politics is basically on uh, shifting sands. And right now, since the corona is at home, people try to go and overcome the problem, but the issue is still alive. So that's what I would call the institutional crisis. The second level of, pro of uh, problem to democracy has to do with the rule of law. And this might be maybe the most severe problem that we are facing here in Israel. Uh, you know, we are experiencing ongoing attacks against uh, the law enforcing authorities here in Israel. It has to do uh, with the fact that uh, our prime minister is uh, functioning with indictment against him, and it is his interest to shaken the trust of the people in the system that's supposed to decide his future. So the integrity of uh, the head of the police that Netanyahu's government appointed and the integrity of the attorney general, which was assistant of, Netan of Netanyahu in the past, is being questioned now by Netanyahu and by his uh, followers. 
Um, you have to know that almost half of the Israeli public says today that they do not have full trust in the Supreme Court of the mm -hmm. State of Israel, which is very troubling, obviously, to all of us. We are experiencing now situations that we never thought may happen. When the Minister of Justice uh, says that not all court orders should be uh, or are binding, unbelievable or where um, the chairperson of the Knesset refused to convince the House only three weeks ago, I think, or two weeks ago, uh, disobeying the order of the court. So all this is making the rule of law in Israel questionable. Are we going to follow court orders in the future if our representatives are showing lack of trust in the court. The third and last level of analysis for me has to do with the crisis of human rights. And this has to do specifically with the coronavirus. I mean, we all over the world, we're experiencing the same thing, but in Israel, we have some kind of edge because you have to realize that the Israeli government, the current one, uh, is using day after day emergency regulations in to uh, control the virus. So you have to realize that actually in Israel, the government acts as a legislative branch right now. And considering the fact that this government till now wasn't elected, it was not elected, it is just a caretaker government. It is obviously causes people like me to feel uncomfortable with the decision of the government. There are restrictions uh, over assembly, over movement, et cetera. You are also, some of you experiencing the same thing, I, I guess. But here, for example, we have a, a decision by the government using this emergency regulation in order to monitor all the cell phones of all citizens by the Shin Bet, by the Secret Service, in order to find out who passed next to somebody who was identified as a uh, with a coronavirus uh, in his body. So the purpose is good, but again, being liberal the, the way I am, when the government decides on it, and it, it was decided when the Knesset was not um, in power, not, not, was not controlling the government, and when the court was not part of the deal, I felt uncomfortable. We know that these kind of things might be the beginning of a slippery slope. Uh, no, all over the world right now things are happening. Uh, I don't have to tell you about what's going on in America. You have your own problems. We are not alone in this crisis, obviously. But all together, we are experiencing right now some kind of perfect uh, storm, you know. Our prime minister is under indictment, so he has a reason to attack the legal system. Uh, Israelis are divided over major, major issues. And uh, we have uh, the, the crisis of the corona, which causes everybody to be on the edge. So this is a general description. I'm sure we'll go into details. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yedidia. Let me go back to Ellie. Um, Ellie, do you see this um, as something which might pass with the, um, with the new government? Uh, you indicated some hope, or do you see a deeper, maybe, revolution in what is happening in exactly what Yudidia just talked about? Um, first, I must say that I subscribe to 95% of what Yudidia uh, said, both descriptively and normatively. You know, we have to be aware that the world is in an unprecedented global crisis. Uh, that prompts emergency governments everywhere. A declaration of emergencies were made in more than 100 countries. Emergency time is not a good time for human rights, but emergencies can also bring to revolutions, end of regimes, destruction of democracy. We know this from a theoretical work. We know this from historical experience. You know, this is the eve of uh, Yom HaShoah here in Israel, the Weimar Republic, 
uh, basically collapsed because of misuse of emergency powers. Uh, we know that this is happening also now. You know, some countries, I would say Hungary, for example, might have been a, a democracy uh, a month ago and might not be classified as a democracy anymore. Uh, there was a revolution uh, under the auspices of emergency. And Israel is on the border of such a situation. And Yedidia described it very well, you know, political, the, the corona crisis met Israel um, in a year-long political and constitutional crisis in which uh, it was governed by illegitimate government or take care government that couldn't make an appointment, appointments, for example, for the chief of police. We have an interim chief of police. For the state attorney, we have an interim state attorney. Um, and uh, with the fact that uh, our prime minister was indicted before the third round of elections that we had just in the first days of the corona crisis. Um, the fact that Netanyahu was indicted for three very serious corruption charges, and he's trying to do everything to uh, delay the trial. Some would say that uh, emergency regulation or order that the Minister of Justice issued in the middle of the night uh, three weeks ago, delaying all courts proceeding, save some very urgent court proceeding, were meant also to delay Netanyahu's trial. It was supposed to be open on March 17th, and now it is delayed. Uh, by attacking, as Yadidia explained, uh, the uh, judicial branch, uh, the uh, state attorney and the general attorney, which are very, very important institution in Israel. In Israel, unlike the U.S., lacks checks and balances. The only check and balances mechanism on the political branches uh, is uh, the legal branch, are the legal branches, the Supreme Court and the Attorney General. And Netanyahu is making, this is already a long process that continues for the last uh, several years. Uh, tries to curtail their independence and bend them to his wishes. Um, so this together with the emergency, uh, emergency regulation that govern our daily life today uh, is an acute danger to uh, Israeli democracy. Now, um, what happened to this evening, you know, <laughs> Um, is interesting. I myself, I would say, I'm uh, doubtful. There was a chance to replace Netanyahu, uh, either with a minority government or with a government supported by uh, the Arab parties who agreed to that. And Gantz uh, opted to enter the government with Netanyahu. And um, I think that he is very, very good meaning. His meaning is to preserve the rule of law, uh, but uh, he's getting into a very, very um, risky uh, surroundings in which he might be uh, cheated upon. Hmm. Um, his entrance to the coalition split his party and, and basically, um, you know, since the government will face a, a very, very tough time economically, medically and other areas, uh, fronts, uh, this government will not be very popular and this might be his political suicide guns. He, I think, thinks that he commits this political suicide in order to safeguard uh, and uh, Israeli democracy, rule of law, uh, etc. Um, and I'm not sure if he will succeed. That's, you know, um, a big question. I think, you know, the, the hand was in, the ball was in the hands of Netanyahu. And Netanyahu had to take a risk. I think the signs yesterday and the day before yesterday were that he is going to a fourth round of election. Uh, people, many people admire the way that he conducts himself and even uh, manages the crisis so far. And Israel managed the crisis relatively better than other countries. Um, but of course, the ramifications of uh, economic meltdown, a huge amount of unemployment, 
um, and all the consequences of the crisis will fall on the government. Okay, so I think that Netanyahu thought that it's too risky to go for fourth election, and from his perspective, uh, to minimize um, danger, it's he um, signed this agreement with Gantz, in which he gives a lot of uh, um, you know a lot of points, a lot of issues that he wanted to pursue. But if it will hold, if Israel's democracy, rule of law, uh, human rights um, are saved, as I said before, it's very early to say. And if he will succeed Netanyahu in 18 months, um, it's of course, is still a big question mark. Um, there was a precedent in 1980s with Shimon Peres and Yitzhak Shamir, but very different times. Um, let me go back to Yedidia maybe for a brief question. Um, one of the <laughs> crucial points, which sticking point really in the negotiations was the, the rights of Netanyahu and the Likud party in the, in the judicial panel, uh, a panel that also appoints the Supreme Court justices. It's very different than the United States. And, and maybe just in a nutshell, I don't know if, if, if it's clear how, this, how the outcome was of that, um, but maybe you can just uh, tell us why this is such a crucial issue and maybe where we stand here. Did you, yeah. you, you want to do that? Sure. Right. Um, you have to realize that in Israel, uh, the judiciary is uh, totally independent, unlike in the States, from any political intervention in the process of nomination of judges. Um, this gives it uh, the power to be able to help Israelis with all the major identity issues. Uh, the big disputes that we are having here are always going to the court. When the Knesset is not able to decide, the court decides. Some people may criticize it, some people are happy with it, but that's a history of our judiciary. Independent, strong, and making decisions on major, major issues. Because of that, those who are not happy with the past history of the judgment of the, of the Israeli Supreme Court, which is basically liberal, those who are not happy with these decisions are trying to change it, to change uh, the makeup of the court, especially the Supreme Court. However, in order to do that, uh, you have to wait a lot of time because every Israeli uh, judge stays in power, stays in, in, in the chair, stays in position till the age of 70. Now in the next uh, uh, coming years, I don't remember exactly if this is a year and a half or two years, another three or four Supreme Court judges out of 15 are going to be replaced because they're reaching the age. So the proud struggle right now is who will be able to decide who will be this decision makers of the Israeli dispute in the Supreme Court. Now, since till now, uh, it wasn't highly politicized because the committee that appoints judges in Israel is, is, is having nine members. The head of it is a justice minister right now to be Mr. Nissen Cohen from Kaholavan, from Gantz party. Another uh, minister from the coalition then two Knesset members, one from the coalition, one from the opposition. These are the four politicians. The other five are not politicians. Three of them are Supreme Court judges, uh, uh, current judges, and the other two are uh, being uh, uh, selected and are represent representing the Bear Association here in Israel. So Netanyahu wants to make sure that from now on, nobody will be able to be a Supreme Court judge using this system or changing the system without his approval. So you have to realize somebody who is going to be judged and by, the, by this branch is going to be the kingmaker of the branch. That's what he wanted to achieve. And this was a major dispute of the coalition agreement right now. I know it because I was involved. It is not the annexation. It is not religion and state. It is not Gaza or Iran. It's who will be member of this committee. Now, I don't know, Michael, what was decided. When I said it's important to look in the details, I meant this one. Yeah, thank you. 
And I, I think what you also indicated is that the justice system, especially at the higher echelons, uh, may not exactly reflect Israeli politics as it is today, which is more to the right, also more to the orthodox parties than it was 10, 20 years ago. Um, and that is something um, that, of course, we will see the next 10, 20 years happening. Um, but I'll leave it here because I know we have a lot of questions from the audience. I saw already the first come in. Um, Laura, would you moderate our Q&A? I will give it a try. So, um, I, again, I want to remind people if they have questions to put them in the chat function. Um, I have a question here from Peggy in Israel. Is Netanyahu attacking the free press as fake news in an effort to discredit reporters? And does Israel have a state news organ, either formerly or informally? Um, and if so, what has been the impact? Yeah, who wants to take this on? It's especially about the... I think television station, there was, of course, also recent, relatively recent developments. If, I don't know, Ellie, do you want to talk about that? or It's not my uh, area of expertise, but I think that in this sense, the situation in the U.S. is worse. Um, of course, you know, one of the corruption charges against Netanyahu is exactly uh, against this background, uh, that he bribed... Uh, a newspaper, uh, the major newspaper in Israel, the Otafonot, uh, for uh, uh, favorable coverage in exchange of uh, economic benefits. Um, of course, Netanyahu is trying to uh, uh, manipulate uh, the press, um, attack the press, attack the stations, television stations, which uh, are not uh, standing on his side. Or the, or identify with his opinion. One of the reflections of what Didier said before about Israel's uh, falling apart as a society is that every, everyone who thinks different uh, is dubbed by the Netanyahu and his people a traitor. And this also refers to many newspaper, uh, new, uh, newspapers, uh, outlets, and other uh, communication venues. Um, but I think that in this context, um, the fight against the media um, is much more significant in Trump's administration uh, than in, in Netanyahu. One of the things that we still have is free press. Uh, we have some outlets uh, um, of media outlets which are free and independent, um, and this is different from other countries. Let me refer to it too. You know, uh, the last, last governor, government, when it was formed about more than five years ago, Netanyahu made clear that he cares mainly on having control over the communication, Ministry of Communication. And in Europe, he felt, and many Israelis do feel the same, that uh, the, not only the court, but the media is too liberal for them. Or as we call it in Israel, they are leftists. And to some degree, this is true. Uh, many of uh, the Israeli major outlets uh, are projecting criticism of the Likud party and of the right, generally speaking, and obviously of Netanyahu. He wanted to have control over that. And to some degree, and he did it, and to some degree he was successful. Because right now we hear different voices in many of the uh, main outlets. Some may say, this is fine, this is fair, let all the voices be heard, and I can understand this. But as of now, and I agree with Ali, we have free society on this regard. People can talk, I can talk, Ali can talk, everybody can be heard. And you know, in America, your slogan, guys, is united we stand. In Israel, for mm -hmm. us Jews here in Israel, it's divided we stand. And uh, we stand divided with free communication, with fights over every issue every day, but it is an open discussion and I don't think that somebody can say, I control the media in Israel. This is not true. Thank you. 
Unfortunately, not so different in the United States either. <laughs> yes. Not much united anymore, um, if there ever was. Okay. So the next question is from a 2015 alumnus of American University, Dan Hammerman, who uh, lived in Israel for some time. Um, Will annexation and other controversial policies towards Palestinians take more of a back seat in the unity government? And um, there was another question, um, a similar type question from Jonathan Band. It seems a bit odd to us in America that issues such as annexation seem to be central in the political debate. Does Gantz support annexation and what do you see happening with relations with the Palestinians? Whoever wants to go first. Okay. Um, as far as I understand in the coalition agreement said that uh, originally he wants to have a veto power of annexation. However, he gave it up. And apparently the coalition agreement, as it's being signed tonight here in Israel, will say that Netanyahu will be able to go ahead with the annexation after he will be advised, ask the advice of Benny Gantz, which means basically not more than that. The other question is reality. Is Netanyahu going to go for it? I think he will have enough support in the Israeli public and in the Knesset the majority will go with it if Trump will support it. Uh, personally, I feel this might be endangering our future as a country, as a Jewish <coughs> state, but anyhow, it might happen. However, you have to realize that right now uh, they will have to, the government will have to deal with the economics, with the coronavirus. But uh, what might happen is because of the hardship the future of the economy of Israel, Netanyahu might go ahead with annexation in order to shift the attention of the people to something else. And it might happen. Um, Jim Connors asks a very broad question. Can anyone speak to the remarkable similarities of current dysfunction and divisiveness in the governments of Israel, the US and UK? Ellie? <laughs> uh, from uh, the three countries, I think the UK are in a better situation. Um, what is interesting, you know, we inherited in Israel uh, various aspects of British law, including the, <clears throat> the mode of emergency. But while our uh, governance of the current crisis is made by um, emergency regulation program promulgated by the government in the middle of the night. In Britain, uh, uh, all measures were enacted by parliament um, and in a democratically manner. Um, and I think that uh, if I would have to score these three countries as Britain, uh, which faces uh, all kinds of other obstacles, from a democratic perspective, rule of law perspective, human rights perspective, uh, is is uh, featuring much better than Israel and the U.S. I, I, you know, I'm not an expert in, in in the U.S. I think that you are going through a very rough period, which is a, might be equivalent to what we are going through in Israel. I think also in the U.S. there are uh, serious questions of the rule of law. A president that calls for um, action or revolution against governors of states, the whole state of federation in the U.S. is, I think, in danger. So it's other kinds of dangers. Um, but I think, um, so this is on, on, on this level. Um, a different level, <coughs> um, uh, if it's a very general question, I will answer a very general answer. A different level of, on, you know, on fighting the corona, uh, and this has to be said uh, something to the credit of Israel. I think that from these three countries, Israel managed so far the best. Um, this was because of very early response, which managed to bring down uh, the number of patients and the number on, and the death toll. Um, but um, 
much better uh, management of the crisis than initially was in the UK and in the US. Also, a, a, a mass volume of um, checks, uh, tests, corona uh, tests, which enable a little bit uh, which will enable not from now on a little bit easing of the lockdowns and, and the social distancing measures. Uh, but, you know, this was initial uh, response of Israel. And um, actually, one of the things that we in the Minerva Center are, are dealing with is that Israel lacks an emergency preparedness, management and recovery system and institutions. So, so far, decision-making by the government was almost based on in, intuition and some experts who happened to participate in the decision-making. Now, when things are much, much more complicated with economic considerations, social considerations, a lot of, lot of problems, the whole management of the crisis is, is uh, in Israel is um, not uh, satisfactory. And I think that this will come up much more now, so the head start that Israel had over US and UK with regard to the uh, treatment uh, fighting the corona is going to disappear or uh, slow down. Let me briefly intervene here. Uh, both of you, would you see the situation is more, or let's say, <clears throat> the, the legal issues we talked about um, in, in safer hands if there would if israel had a, a real constitution which it does yeah. not have yeah um i think i mean about half a year ago a group of cadets from west point visited here in israel and i was asked to talk to them and uh, one of this young very impressive actually uh, soldier asked me a question that was i was then asked for the first time the question was can you Israelis teach us Americans how to live together with dis disputes? Because as I said earlier, we, we are experts on this. And as this cadet says, we are experiencing now a new phase in American life where we are divided totally. People are against the president in very severe ways. So how, what is a miracle, he asked for you Israelis? I believe the major difference between Israel and America on these issues is the following. There is one advantage to Israel and one advantage to America when you compare the two places. In Israel, we have a basic solidarity, which is really, I would say, the most important asset of the state for survival. Right now, we are starting here the Yom HaShoah. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning, all Israelis will hear the siren. Nobody can go out of home. So everybody is being asked to go to the balcony. You know, we have balconies here. And every Israeli will be in the balcony. In Leila Seder, only a week and a half ago, uh, everybody at 8.30, night time, went out to the balcony. We all sang together Manishtana. This is an asset that you cannot really uh, underestimate. Let me say, though, that, of course, this counts for the 75% Jewish Israelis only. That's true, that you're 100% right. But it gives, it, it's, it's a large majority, and it gives some kind of stability, despite the cultural war and the fact that we do not agree about the vision of the state, which is interesting. That's the Israeli advantage, I would say. What is the American advantage over Israel? This has to do with your question, Michael. We do not have a constitution. When you Americans, when you fight with each other, you come back to the safe harbor of the constitution, you interpret it differently, but you agree that this is something that you start arguing with in your hands. We do not have the same. We do have the declaration of independence, you know, but this is not a constitution, it's just a symbolic, uh, important document, but it is not replacing the rules of the game that we do not have here in Israel. So personally, to answer your question, Michael, I believe that the Constitution cannot change disputes into agreements. 
but constitution at least can help us conduct our discussion and arguments and disagreements within uh, known uh, rules of the game, and this is quite important. Thank you. Uh, may I add, you know, about the constitution? Uh, I subscribe to most of what Yadidia said. Uh, Israel needs a constitution, um, but uh, two covenants. You know, first of all, constitution doesn't solve everything. Uh, most of the states, the vast majority of states, have constitution. There are only three where they do, do not have a, a rigid written constitution. It's UK, New Zealand, and us. And uh, I think we fare better than many totalitarian countries and even democracies or past democracies who have constitutions. Um, I, I, I want to say something uh, uh, which is really irrelevant because I saw just now on, on the web that one of the um, details of the coalition agreement is that Gantz agreed that the uh, nation state law uh, israel as a nation state of the jewish uh, uh, israel as the nation state of the jewish people law basic law uh, would not be changed this is meant to be part of israel constitution and it's a very very bad and uh, uh, law um, really uh, uh, um, working or symbolically uh, expressing um, um, uh, expressing inferior, uh, superior uh, sentiments towards the minorities in Israel, not only symbolically, but also in action. Um, so not every constitution is a solution, and th uh, it really depends what kind of a constitution. And the third point, you know, the two of the very interesting controversies of these days, which are part of our political and constitutional crisis, the question, it's not two slightly different question. One question is whether a prime minister can be, uh, a, a person can serve as a prime minister after uh, his indictment. We don't have an exact rule about that. We have a, um, um, as an article in the basic law, the, the government that says that a prime minister that was convicted uh, has to resign or, um, but not with regard to indictment. And we don't have a rule with regard to the question whether, and this is already an irrelevant question in, in the context of tonight's news, but whether uh, the president can give the right to form a government, the mandate to form a government to a person who is indicted, to a, a Knesset member who was indicted. And, and I'm not sure that had we had a constitution, detailed constitution, uh, Democracy Institute initiative from about 20 years ago, when we, uh, Yadidia and I, served together in an attempt to draft a constitution. Um, a constitution would have addressed these two questions. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, most constitutions, I don't think, address these uh, questions in detail. So um, the political crisis and the constitutional crisis would not have been prevented with a rigid constitution. So in sum, to sum up, yes, constitution is important, especially with regard to the rule of the game, the institutional power, uh, uh, the division of powers um, and, uh, um, and decision-making processes, especially, but it's not a solution, a magic solution to, to everything. So speaking of the rules of the game, we have another question from a current student, Mikhail Cohen. Um, is there something that can be done so that what happened in the past year with all the multiple elections won't happen again? Sure. Many things theoretically can be done. I'll tell you what I think should be done regarding these uh, undecisive elections. Um, I support the suggestion that uh, in the future, the head of the largest party on the election day will become immediately, automatically, the man or the woman who can form a government without the whole process we're having right now. Meaning that many Israelis, when they will decide who to vote for, will know that they may 
I'm making decision who will be the prime minister, not only what party I support, but what person I support to be a prime minister. Therefore, my anticipation is that if this will be the law, many Israelis will vote for one of four blocks. One will be the right and center. There will be no right wing parties anymore, which are on the extreme, because you do not help your prime minister to be voted in. So it will be one party, the other party will be left and center, extreme left anymore in Israel. Then you'll have the Arab bloc and the ultra-Orthodox bloc. And you'll have four blocks and that's all. By the end of the count of the votes on election day, we'll know who is going to be the prime minister. Now, obviously, like every plan, this has some kind of uh, problems. It will give, it might give unproportional power to the smaller two blocks, meaning the Arabs and the ultra-Orthodox. But in a way, it might be good as well. But you will know one day I may need this uh, Arab uh, party in order to form a government because I have no other choice to form a government. This might change the mood and make them kosher to be part of a coalition, which I think should happen 72, 72 years ago. So because it's getting a little bit late, I'm gonna combine the last three questions. So maybe you could answer them. They don't necessarily relate to one another. There was an early question from Robin Lieberman about um, human rights in the corona response as it relates to asylum seekers in Tel Aviv. This has been in the news in the last couple of days. It has to do with the deposit law and what will happen with the salary, with the funds for, of asylum seekers in regard to the deposit law. Um, is there any room on the political agenda to strengthen protections for asylum seekers at this time? And then the last two questions, again, are pretty um, broad um, and ones which I know you all have expertise. First, can you comment on the future of religious secular relations under the new coalition government? And second, um, that's from Jonathan Band, and then from Joy Minman, who I believe is, is uh, joining us from Israel. Um, there will be appeals to the Supreme Court to prevent Netanyahu from continuing to serve as prime minister. Will these prevail? Whoever wants to go first. I'm willing. Okay. Um, regarding religion and state in Israel, what will happen? Most likely, nothing. Meaning the status quo will stay the same way it is right now. Netanyahu will not touch it with a stick because he needs the ultra-Orthodox in order to sustain himself in power. Gantz cares, I know personally, he cares about these issues but this is not the issue because of which he went into politics. So he's not going to fight a big fight about the issue of the Kotel or the issue of Shabbat, the way Shabbat is uh, conducted in Israel or about uh, recruitment, recruitment bill or about personal law in Israel. So my anticipation is that nothing will be changed in this government as long as it is the same way the uh, coalition is right now. Now regarding the more, I would say, uh, intriguing question, what the Supreme Court will do when uh, uh, the court will have to decide whether Netanyahu can serve as a prime minister uh, with indictment over his head. Now, as you may know, some people went already to the court and ask the court to decide this issue earlier three or four times. And time after time, the court said uh, it's theoretical, so we do not have to, to make a decision. Now it's not theoretical anymore. I believe that the court was mistaken for delaying the answer and saying it's, it is theoretical. Because now the people went to the ballot knowing that Netanyahu is uh, under the indictment. 
Nevertheless, enough Israelis voted for him. And nevertheless, Gantz decided to go with him, breaking his promise, his main promise, not Bibi. Yes, with Bibi. So from any realistic point of view, I don't see that the court will be able to throw Netanyahu out of his office. Now, if the law will be, would have been, if the law would have been clear and cut, that's something else. But the law, the law is not clear and cut. It is open for interpretations. And I don't see the court interpreting it now against uh, Netanyahu in the current situation. Just to add a little thing to what Ali said, I think that the only person who is authority not to let Netanyahu being a prime minister in the current situation is Rivlin, the president. His decision, his discretion is his. There is no law telling him how he is supposed to use his discretion. And the court cannot intervene with his decision-making process. But as Ali said, rightfully, right now, Rivlin does not have the power anymore. And as far as I can tell, Netanyahu will be the prime minister. Okay, do you want to add something to the other questions maybe, Ali? But the second seeker, I, I, I'm not familiar with the details over there. Sure. Seems to be, it seems to be to be not fair what they're doing, but I don't want to talk about something that I'm not really familiar with. So right. I'm going to skip. In the last last three minutes, Ellie, do you want to right. add I, something? I agree, I agree with uh, Yedidia that the Supreme Court is very unlikely to intervene against uh, uh, Netanyahu who's being prime minister. If he's voted by the Knesset, uh, uh, he was voted the, into uh, his part, you know, the elections took place after the indictment. The court will be very, very hesitant to intervene. Uh, with regard to asylum seeker, you know, the Israeli treatment of asylum seeker is quite horrendous in the last past years, uh, especially by the current government. But I don't think that the specific uh, corona crisis made their situation worse. Actually, on the contrary, uh, they are getting health. Uh, treatment even if they are not insured um, and they're supposed to get some of the funds that they respectfully uh, uh, um, uh, deposited for the, uh, by the instructions of the previous government. So I don't think, think that this situation makes uh, the, the current crisis makes them uh, more fragile or well, all uh, uh, minorities, this, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Risky populations are, uh, of course, disadvantaged by the situation. I don't think that this extends more to the asylum seekers. Um, with regard to um, last word, maybe with regard to what Yedidia said before about Parliament, the Israeli Parliament, and the four groups. You know, one of the beauties of the Israeli system is that our Knesset really represents all views, groups, ideologies in society. Because of proportional representation, you don't have it in the US, you don't have it in the UK, you don't have it in countries in which the threshold is very high. Uh, this is one of the source of our conflicts, but it's also a source of pride. And I would, you know, I, I think that the Knesset must play, especially under our uh, circumstances, must play a much greater role in government that it used to play in the past. Because in the Knesset, coalitions uh, <clears throat> on various different issues, state and religion, other issues, uh, are different from the government coalition. And there are surprising coalitions between ultra-Orthodox and Arab parties, between right and left. And, uh, and I think it's a very important mechanism. So this representative Knesset is very important. One word with regard to law, to uh, state and religion, I also subscribe to Redidia that I don't think that uh, the government will change things. But we have to remember that uh, despite the rhetoric of the current, the, the previous government, uh, which was much more nationalistic and much more orthodox uh, with regard to its attitudes, and uh, Yadidia mentioned some of the uh, disputes, the Wailing Wall and, and others, the situation on the ground is that 
many, many, the, the status quo changes in favor of the liberal camp. Uh, you have, we have now public transportation. It's not state public transportation. It's organized by municipalities in the whole of uh, um, the uh, center of Israel. Um, and things on the ground are very different from uh, legislation and political rhetoric. And if this status quo will remain while we are treating uh, this crisis, and especially the crisis of uh, democracy, in Israel, it will not be a, a very horrible thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, thank you all for listening, contributing. And uh, let me just say at the end, uh, thinking about what Yadidia said before about Israel, uh, despite all the divisions, there is a, some kind of sense of solidarity and, and unity. Um, just imagine in this country, you would have 18 months of President Trump followed by 18 months of President Biden. They would just agree to go into a unity government. <laughs> I think this is uh, just beyond what all of us could imagine. Um, if it's good or not good for Israel, we will all probably find out in a couple of years from now, not today or next week. But our uh, series of Zoom conversations with another expert next week. Professor Fania Oz Salzberger um, will talk about, um, will be in conversation about uh, how Israel is changing during the corona crisis. Um, what are the changes in society, in culture, in politics? She'll also talk a little bit about the legacy of her late father Amos Oz. And uh, of course, you're all welcome to join us a week from now. And again, thank you so much, Professor Stern, Professor Salzberger, Yedidia and Ellie. thank you. I know you're very busy at this time. I'm sure you'll be in many other conversations uh, in the coming days. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. We did um, record this call, so if some of you missed part of it, you can contact us and, and we may be able to send you a recording. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.